So, so they're fourteen percent of the force, but take seventy percent of the casualties. Is that right? Yeah, no wonder they keep deserting. What a rotten place to fight, huh? Ah, oh, yeah, you're right. It's not better anywhere else these days. Yeah, true that, huh? All right. May 6, 1944. We see rivalry and self-interest in the Allied High Command in Italy, and that might soon cause some problems with the actual conduct of the war. But rivalry and self-interest in the Chinese Nationalist Army in China has caused not just problems, but total chaos, and it has caused it now. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, Japan's Operation Ishigo continued in central China. Their campaign Ugo continued in northeastern India. The Allies began a new operation in Burma. They ended one in New Guinea, securing the Huan Peninsula, and secured their landings elsewhere in New Guinea at Hollandia. Early this week at Hollandia, the Allied food and supply situation, which was pretty shaky last week, is resolved by air. But on the 29th, they've also reopened the captured airfields here and down the coast at Aitape. There has been some Japanese resistance to the landings, but not like we've seen elsewhere. One big reason for this is that the Japanese here were largely admin and support units, and none of the senior Japanese officials has been at his post for more than a few weeks. Also, the attack has been overkill proportions. A four to one advantage in men really did the trick. Edward Dray's MacArthur's Ultra lays the big success at Douglas MacArthur's feet for exploiting intelligence from code breaking. Well, for the fight, the Japanese lose 3,300 killed and 300 captured. The Americans, 152 killed and just over 1,000 wounded. The rest of the Japanese are trying to head overland to Sarmi, though not that many will actually reach it. Losing Hollandia has made all Japanese positions to the east, like that of 18th Army at Wewak, untenable. So they'll have to hike through the jungle around Aitapi and Hollandia to the west to link up with other Japanese or counterattack. There is a change in Japanese command this week, by the way. On May 3rd, Soimu Toyoda is named commander of Japan's combined fleet, replacing Minaichi Koga, who died at the end of March. May 1st is, as always, May Day, and Joseph Stalin gives a speech to the USSR. He talks about the progress of the war, making specific mention of the Allies holding the front in Italy, tying down a lot of the Germans there. May 1st is also U.S. 5th Army Commander Mark Clark's 48th birthday. He is quite busy this week because the Allies have a huge new Italian operation, Diadem, set to go off next week on the 11th to finally break through the German lines in Italy and reach Rome. Cool and remote, yet capable of conviviality and brilliance, Clark could also be picayune and mulish, protective of his prerogatives, and as the war went on, he grew increasingly ready at slights, real or imagined. The nickname Marcus Aurelius Clarkus never seemed to fade. He does, it is true, feud with other commanders quite a lot, particularly the British ones. Even on his birthday, he takes a break from the festivities to fight with Harold Alexander, commander of Allied armies in Italy, about the air support given to 8th Army at the expense of 5th Army. Clark's forces by now are quite big. He commands seven American, four French, and two British divisions, which is several times the force he arrived in Italy with last September. But there are issues with the new arrivals. Even though basic training in the U.S. is now 17 weeks, up from 13, he does get a lot of men who really don't have much in the way of military skill, and even a fair amount of illiterate troops. His two newest units, the 85th and 88th Infantry Divisions, are mainly drafted men, and not only is their combat value unknown, but of the six regiments in those divisions, four of their commanders have already been removed for age or physical issues. Clark also has little faith now in the two British divisions at Anzio. The British forces in Italy have taken tens of thousands of casualties, but replacements do not keep up with losses and morale is terrible. The British convict an average of 10 deserters a day here this spring. The Americans too have a great deal of desertions and self-inflicted wounds. 
It's the infantry that bears the greatest burden in general. Rick Atkinson points out that among the Americans, the infantry makes up 14% of the Army's overseas strength, but takes 70% of the casualties. So soldiers no longer wonder if they're going to get hit, but when. The Army Surgeon General says, practically all men in rifle battalions who were not otherwise disabled ultimately became psychiatric casualties, typically after 200 to 240 cumulative days of combat. Clark is, by this point, obsessed with reaching Rome and reaching it quickly. He knows that the Allied invasion of Normandy is scheduled for June, and that is going to completely overshadow Italy once it begins, especially if it succeeds. He also has no intention of sharing credit for taking Rome with the British. He writes in his diary this week, I know factually there are interests brewing for the 8th Army to take Rome, and I might as well let Alexander know that if he attempts anything of the kind, he will have another all-out battle on his hands, namely with me. The Allies do have a huge advantage over their enemy in Italy in every kind of number, though, and the plans for Operation Diadem are ambitious, and they begin with knocking the enemy off Monte Cassino and opening the Leary Valley, an assault to be made by Oliver Lees's 8th Army. Clark's 5th will attack on their left. Thing is, Alexander's final order for the operation does not specify which army is to take Rome, though all the preliminary plans have 8th Army veering away from it towards the east. Lees has, with his army, 56,000 Poles in two divisions under Władysław Anders, the second Polish corps, and it is they who are to take Monte Cassino. Clark has the French Expeditionary Corps with him under Alphonse Juin, nearly 100,000 strong by this time. They've been training for mountain warfare because he plans to climb the Arunchi Highland, 1,500 meters in height between the Leary Valley and the sea. And Juin plans this not for just the French, but for both of Clark's Army Corps here, 170,000 men and 300 tanks to attack into the mountains and outflank and unhinge the Gustav Line. He has sold Clark on this plan, a calculated risk. The massive supply lines of massive supplies have been ever growing. Clark has 10,000 mules and 2,000 horses. At the beachhead at Anzio, a million tons of stuff is ready to supply Clark as he drives past. Lucian Truscott's Sixth Corps there is seven divisions and 232 tanks, and Truscott meets with Alexander V to discuss when and where they should try to break out. Alexander issues an order for what they have codenamed Buffalo, cutting Highway 6 east of the Colli Laziali at Valmonton once the German reserves have been lured to Casino, cutting German 10th Army supply and retreat line, and hopefully leading to a big decisive battle that will destroy them. Clark is furious that Alexander issues orders to his subordinate, though, and today he visits Truscott to tell him the only thing that matters is taking Rome. He also adds, the British were hatching nefarious schemes to get there first. Moreover, Buffalo was tactically dubious. Too many roads ran north from the casino front to trap 10th Army by severing Highway 6. They may be heading for a showdown, but either way, the attacks are to begin just a few days from now. Fighting that is very much in progress now, however, is happening in central China. The one division Tang Enbo has sent to interdict the Japanese near Shuchang sees action this week as several divisions of Japanese infantry and a tank division run into it. After 24 hours, the Chinese are thoroughly beaten and Shuchang is in Japanese hands. But hey, we saw a couple weeks ago that Tang Enbo has plenty of men and that Chang planned to fight a big battle west of Xu Chang. So why did he only send one division? In fact, Tang Enbo asked for permission to fight, but after pondering on the fighting capability of Tang's troops, Chang ended up hesitating. He worried such an action might lure the Japanese forces away from their intention to link the Peking-Wuhan Railroad and attack instead at Luoyang, 
the ancient capital of China, which was located to the northwest of Shuchang along the Yellow River. He thus asked Tang Enbo and his army to withdraw to the nearby hilly areas in the hope that constant menace from the west would prevent the Japanese from maintaining unimpeded railroad transportation, even though he did not doubt the Japanese capability to move southward along the railroad. By May, there are several Japanese divisions moving down the railway, but one of the infantry divisions and the tank division turn and launch a quick attack up the Ruha River Valley towards Luoyang. This throws Tang Enbo's forces into disarray, and they break into smaller units and head for safety into the western Henan Hills and Mountains. Apparently, Tang himself heads further west and loses contact with much of his forces. Chang has at least phone contact with some of them and orders them directly to fight, but as they are disorganized, the Japanese break through them. He also keeps ordering Tang to return and actually take command of his forces and stabilize the lines. Meanwhile, some of the Japanese armor breaks off and reaches the highland overlooking the southern approach to Luoyang. As this is happening, another Japanese force is heading west along the right bank of the Yellow River and hits the positions of Jiang Dingwen's first war zone forces, which also drives them into a retreat. Chang's journal describes much of what happens next. He's now phoning both Jiang Dingwen and Tang Enbo and trying to get them to hold their lines, and he's directly issuing orders to their subordinates. He's trying to get planes to bomb the Japanese spearheads. When the Japanese pause to regroup the fifth, his armies are in a state of chaos that he was not prepared for. His two generals here are unable to follow his orders and even maintain contact with each other and their troops. Jiang has reported a serious Japanese breakthrough, which aerial recon shows is not true, but he's moved his headquarters from Luoyang westward without telling Chang or, or anyone really where they are going. It's a tough situation. It's also interesting to note that while Chang's journal says Jiang has Luoyang as his headquarters, Hans van de Ven says it's Tang Enbo's. For all I can find, it might be both, which seems to be a stretch, but defending Luoyang is the job of the first war zone, and it is their armies that are to do that. Jiang, by the way, places the blame for the chaos that is unfolding squarely on Chang's shoulders. According to Rana Mitter, he says his forces should have attacked already April 23rd or 24th, but he does not get an order from Chang until this week on the 1st. Well, there is a lot more to say about all of this, which I will get to over the coming weeks. One Allied operation that began last week was Operation Endrun in Burma. Merrill's marauders set off to cross the Kumon Mountains, go around the Japanese, and take Michina. They began the 28th, hoping to cover the 150 kilometers of mountain and jungle before the monsoons begin. This does not happen since the monsoon rains begin already April 30th, but they do not abort their mission. In fact, this week they managed to mostly cross the Kumon Range with 25 kilos of gear per man. The Kumon Range rose to heights of between two and 6,000 feet. No roads of any kind existed, only a few broken muddy trails. Mules routinely slipped and fell hundreds of feet to their deaths, or were so badly injured that soldiers had to make their way downhill and kill them. Still, this week on the 5th, they descend into the valley and skirmish with the Japanese at Ritpong and Tenkrukong. Even in a state of total exhaustion, they begin the final push for Michina. A few hundred kilometers to the west, the Japanese are still currently pushing for Impal. Though the battle for Crete West on the Tamu Road approach to Impal winds down on the 1st. Sunoru Yamamoto's Japanese forces are pretty exhausted by now. He's also been using the Indian National Army in his battles. 300 of them attacked the Palel airfield last week, attacks which failed, and then the INA complained that they had gotten no backup from the Japanese. They're fighting Doug Gracie's 20th Indian Infantry Division. And though they too have taken a lot of casualties over the past few weeks, Gracie consoled himself that Bose's Indian National Army had also been in action against his Indians and Gurkhas and had been roughly treated and almost annihilated. When the survivors tried to surrender, they tended to fall foul of the Gurkhas' dreaded kukri. 
the fighting between David Cowan's 17th Indian Division and Nobuo Tanaka's Japanese 33rd Division around Bishanpur continues unabated this week, though. The Allied forces get a real surprise when Japanese air power turns up for the first time in the Impal campaign, both bombing and strafing their airfields. 25 Zeros even raid Bishanpur today on the 6th, but Cowan's men are not idle. They begin a flanking operation to cut the Japanese supply line to the south and then surround Tanaka's division. 48th Brigade is to make its way around to the south and be the anvil, the hammer, is to be the other two brigades. We'll see how that goes in a week or two. Already now, though, the food situation for the Japanese at Impal is becoming serious. Up north at Kohima Ridge, the Allies are steadily overcoming the Japanese positions one at a time, but it is a tough battle. This week on the 3rd, they take part of GPT Ridge and soon manage to also take part of FSD Ridge, but that's only part. They enter Naga Village, they get thrown out of Naga Village. Tanks would help the operation greatly, but they can't handle the gradients of the ridges and hills here, and heavy rains turn the ground to mud anyhow, which they also cannot handle. So the battle is still heavy, even though the siege was broken three weeks ago. It is the Allies who have someone under at least partial siege now at Sevastopol. Well. On the 5th, the Soviet assault on the city begins. But with heavy convoy operations the past three weeks, the Axis have managed to evacuate 40,000 men and a lot of supplies. The Soviets begin by hitting the northern defenses, but this may be a feint. We shall see next week. And over in Romania on May 2nd, troops from Ivan Konyev's 2nd Ukrainian Front launch an offensive north of Targu Frumos. They break through the German and Romanian defenses at a couple of points already that day, but they do lose as much as half of their 358 tanks and self-propelled guns. Attacks the next day on narrower fronts are unsuccessful though, as are even more attacks the 4th, and Konyev calls off further offensive moves. His men are pretty exhausted and under strength after the fighting of the past few months, but he has assumed the enemy facing him is in the same or worse condition. They are not, and tomorrow will effectively counterattack. And the week comes to an end, with successful Japanese attacks and confusion and chaos among the Chinese forces in China. Heavy fighting that concludes nothing but making the Japanese hungry at Impal and Kohima, and a big Allied offensive in Italy getting ever closer to launch date. You may have noticed that I did not have much to say this week about the Eastern Front. Other than the fighting in Crimea at the end of the week and that small offensive in Romania, there has not been that much actively going on on the front lines. But I will end today with some observations by Earl Zemke from his book, Stalingrad to Berlin. This is a long quote, even though it's not written out on the screen like other quotes are. Oh, and do not write in and say, hey man, you know it's the Soviets, not the Russians, they're not the same thing. Yeah, I know, but it's a quote, and I'm not gonna change the words of a quote. In April and May 1944, it seemed that destiny might yet bow to the Fuhrer's will. If the invasion, the coming Allied one of France could be defeated. Germany could turn its full strength east. The prospects of a victory in the West appeared good. By the end of April, new panzer divisions had filled the gap in the Western defenses created when 2nd SS Panzer Corps was transferred east. The southern half of the Eastern Front was a jerry-built nightmare, but in the center, 290 miles west of Moscow, between Vitebsk and Orsha, the gateway to the Soviet capital was still in German hands. At the closest point, the Russians were still 550 miles from Berlin. That's nearly 900 kilometers. In May, the Russians occupied themselves with extensive troop movements, but gave no sign that they would do anything to make the Allies' landing easier. The Soviet May Day proclamation set the liberation of all Soviet territory as the first Soviet objective and appeared to put the drive towards Germany distinctly into second place. Although in the spring, German army strength on the Eastern Front reached a new low, 2,242,649 men, and that of the Soviet army another high, 6,077,000. In other respects, German strength was actually in an upswing. Synthetic oil production reached its peak in April 1944, and stocks of aviation fuel were larger than at any time since 1941. Side note here, 
The Germans have about 2,000 more planes now than at this time last year. Enough tanks and weapons to equip new divisions for the Western Front and replace some of the losses in Russia were coming off the assembly lines. All in all, it appeared that Germany could await the next roll of the dice with confidence. Well, makes sense. Maybe, despite the losses of the past year, Germany is in position to pull off victory. Maybe. That impending invasion is actually coming a month from today. And we are covering it in real time over 24 hours and even setting up a new channel to do so, D-Day 24 Hours. So go over there and subscribe so you do not miss a thing. All of this content and that content and all of our content relies on the support of the Time Ghost Army. So for ever more of this, go and join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. These are the newest officers and the Time Ghost Army member of the week is Jim Thinell or Tinell. Not sure about production. Production, pronunciation. Uh, I mentioned, though, uh, synthetic oil. Okay. We did a whole special a while back about Germany's oil and oil production situation. You can click right here for that. And do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.